The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. It will be impossible for me to analyse the entire poem with you in the time we have today, so I am going to direct your attention to some of the key images in the poem, and you will look at the poem more closely with your teacher in class. Eliot began writing Prufrock in February 1910, and it was first published in 1915, so it was written prior to World War I, but still at a time of great social and political upheaval. At the time of its publication, the poem was considered unusual, but is now seen as heralding a paradigmatic cultural shift from late 19th century romantic verse and Georgian lyrics to modernism. The poem is regarded as the beginning of Eliot's career as an influential poet. Before we get into the poem, it is important for us to look at the Imagist movement as a way of approaching Prufrock's poem. In 1910, a small group of poets met in London under the name of their new movement, Imagism. The leader of this group was Ezra Pound. Literary movements, like political, religious and artistic movements, generally arise as a reaction against the immediate tradition. So if we were to understand Imagism, we need to consider what they disliked about poetry accepted at the time. The Imagists believed that the Romantic tradition, initiated by Wordsworth, had lost its energy, its power to move, and had become conventional sentiment. That much of the poetry was decadent, emotionally dishonest, decorative, and sentimental. That the poetry had predictable and imprecise imagery and rhymes, iambic regularity, and subjective emotionalism. And that it offered no revelation, no surprise, no sense of the sharp particularity of experience. In contrast to this, the imagists believe that the poet must communicate in terms of objective images, clear, precise, concentrated and fresh symbols, which captured the emotional qualities under exploration. Think of cubism, a popular art form of the time, where objects are analysed, broken up and reassembled in an abstract form. Instead of depicting objects from one viewpoint, in imagism, the artist depicts the subject from a multitude of multitude of viewpoints. This is similar to what is happening in modernist poetry, where poets are presenting a collage of ideas rather than a unified story as such. The imagists believe that poets should not be telling us how they feel. They should be presenting us with images which capture the feeling so that the reader can react to the image. Poems, in other words, should not be interpreting the experience for us. They should provide the objective means by which we can by which we can ourselves as readers discover what matters. They believe that modern verse should emancipate itself from the notion that language had to fit some preconceived pattern. Rather, the pattern should emerge from what was demanded by the language at that particular moment. Hence, imagism promoted what came to be called free verse. Eliot said, Our civilization comprehends great variety and complexity. And this variety and complexity, played upon a refined sensibility, must produce various and complex results. The poet must become more and more comprehensive, more elusive, more indirect, in order to force, to dislocate if necessary, language into his meaning. And if you think back to our workshop last week about modernism, you will remember that composers in the modern period were responding to a changing and uncertain world and were looking for new ways to represent this in their works. And this is what imagism was trying to capture. In Eliot's poem, we are presented with a series of images and a key technique in reading Eliot is to stop looking for conventional means of coordinating this long poem. Don't look for a story or a developing description or an argument, for example. Focus instead on what each apparently discontinuous part of the poem reveals about the consciousness of the speaking voice, for the definition of the consciousness is the main purpose of the poem. Eliot is famous for his coining of the term objective correlative. The only way of expressing emotion in the form of art is by finding an objective correlative, T.S. Eliot said. In other words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the external facts, which must terminate in sensory experience, are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. What he means is, is that it's the job of the artist to find a fictional equivalent to the emotion he wishes to explore, something adequate to the complexity of the feeling. 
So as we listen to T.S. Eliot reading the poem, I would like you to write down the key images that stand out or resonate with you. What feeling or emotion do you think Eliot is trying to evoke in the reader? As we listen to the poem, we may puzzle over what could possibly be the logical connection between the fog, the women who come and go speaking of Michelangelo, a crab, coffee spoons, Lazarus, Hamlet and the mermaids. But the connection is clear enough. They were all expressions of and images illuminating Prufrock himself, glimpses into his emotional state. The personality is by no means unified. In fact, what emerges is the inability of the modern consciousness either to see unity in the world outside or to bring a disordered world any, a disordered world any sense of inner integrity. It's as if the mo in the modern age there cannot be a single authoritative way of expressing how one feels. There is not enough confidence in the forms of language itself. The discontinuity discont between the images defining the consciousness of the speaker serves to indicate what for Eliot is a major manifestation of modern life, the loss of the integrated personality. The disparate images serve to illuminate a distinctive personality, at once modern, fractured, urban and emotionally uncertain. Prufrock is the inner monologue of a city gentleman who is stricken by feelings of isolation and inadequacy, with an incapability of taking decisive action. Let's now take a moment to consider the title of the poem. The words love song suggest a tender romantic mood that is immediately undercut with the pompous and slightly ridiculous name of J. Alfred Prufrock. The title is our first indication that Eliot is planning to subvert our expectations. The irony is that this is not a conventional love song. It is not lyrical. The name doesn't roll off the tongue. Another surprise is the Italian epigraph. There is a big clue to the poem's meaning in the epigraph. And while it is tempting to skip over it, it is actually important to know what these lines mean and where they are from. The lines are from Dante's Inferno. Dante was an Italian poet of the Middle Ages. He wrote the Divine Comedy, an allegorical vision of the afterlife divided into three parts. One of these sections, Inferno, is about a journey through hell. The epigraph translated means... If I but thought that my response were made to one perhaps returning to the world, this tongue of flame would cease to flicker. But since up from the depths no one has yet returned alive, if what I hear is true, I answer without fear of infamy. These lines are spoken by a sinner trapped in hell, and he is prom promising to reveal details of his life only because he thinks his words will never be repeated on earth. But this lost soul is damned and he speaks only because he is sure no one will listen. So there is an implication that we are also about to enter a kind of private hell. Prufrock finds himself in a situation, in a society which is like hell for him, and believes that there is no way out. Also, like Guido, Prufrock can present his feelings without fear of infamy. Eliot narrates the experience of Prufrock using the stream of consciousness technique developed by his fellow modernist writers. The poem is a dramatic interior monologue of an urban man stricken with feelings of isolation and an incapability for decisive action that is said to epitomise the frustration and impotence of the modern individual. Prufrock laments his physical and intellectual inertia, the lost opportunities in his life and his lack of spiritual progress. With feelings of weariness, regret, embarrassment, longing, a sense of decay and an awareness of mortality, Prufrock has become one of the most recognised voices in modern literature. Perhaps the most significant mystery of the poem lies in the overwhelming question that Prufrock is trying to ask throughout the poem. Many believe that Prufrock is trying to tell a woman of his romantic interest in her, pointing to the various images of women's arms and clothing, and the final few lines in which Prufrock laments that the mermaids will not sing to him. Others, however, believe that Prufrock is trying to express some deeper philosophical insight or disillusionment with society, but fears rejection, pointing to statements that express a disillusionment with society, such as, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. 
Many believe that the poem is a criticism of modern society and Prufrock's dilemma represents the inability to live a meaningful existence in the modern world. J. Alfred Prufrock is the persona of the poem. Don't make the mistake of thinking that it is Eliot himself. What happens in the poem is mostly going on in Prufrock's head. While he appears to be talking to a second person, he is really just talking to himself. The poem begins with a simple invitation. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. It sounds like a lovely romantic evening, but in line three we get our first example of the kind of startling, shocking and unexpected imagery for which the modernists are known, when the evening is compared to a patient etherized upon a table. This is a jarring image. The imagery implies sickness, numbness, dissection, connotations that are very appropriate for the mood of the rest of the poem. We picture someone unconscious, helpless, about to endure examination, so the reader is immediately plunged into this alienating world. He then describes a drab, sordid neighbourhood with cheap hotels and restaurants, restless nights and half-deserted streets. Note the emptiness of the world, of the world, oyster shells, sawdust restaurants, Everything is impermanent. Everything is about to dissolve into nothing. The world is transitory, half-broken, unpopulated, and about to collapse. There is a tone of despair and a feeling of helplessness. Eliot uses rhymed couplets in this opening stanza, but the irregular line length and unpredictable rhyme create a jarring effect and exemplify a new kind of poetry intended to replicate the complexities uncertainties and alienation of modern life. It is then that we first hear the refrain that is to be repeated throughout the poem. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. At a social gathering, women are discussing the great Renaissance artist, engaging in idle chatter designed to impress each other. Prufrock may wonder how they could possibly be interested in him when they are discussing someone as illustrious as Michelangelo a man of great accomplishment and creative energy. Smoky haze spreads across the city. The haze is like a timid cat padding to and fro, rubbing his head on objects, licking its tongue and curling up to sleep after allowing soot to fall upon it. The speaker resembles the cat as he looks into windows or into the room, trying to decide whether to enter and become part of the activity. Eventually, he curls up on his own, alone, separate. Prufrock feels inferior and is unable to act decisively. He consigns himself to corners, as a timid person might at a dance, and becomes, in his mind at least, the brunt of ridicule or condescension, just like the soot. Prufrock says there will be time to wonder whether he dares to approach a woman. He feels like turning back. After all, he has a bald spot, thinning hair, thin arms and legs. He has doubts about the acceptability of his clothing. What will people think of him? Does he dare to approach a woman? He will think about it and make a decision and then reverse his decision. Meanwhile, the women are still coming and going talking of Michelangelo, suggesting that life is repetitive and dull. The next section increases the tension by raising the question, do I dare disturb the universe? This shows Prufrock's fear of his society and the people in it. Eventually, he enters the room and remembers the time he has heard the same voices, seen the same people. He has seen their gazes many times before, gazes that form an opinion of him, treating him like an insect pinned in, into place in a display, an object of scrutiny. How will he be able to explain himself to them, the mediocrity of his life? His knowledge of these unbearable social situations make him hesitate. The self-conscious pretension, the surface politeness, the lack of authenticity and compassion. He knows that society very well and he does not like it. He finds it trivial and boring. He says, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Once again, the line sets us up for something grand. I have measured out my life and then is undercut with the image of coffee spoons, symbolising the unheroic nature of his life. Then he starts to rehearse what he dares not to say, and he ultimately doesn't say it. 
He fails. He never asks the question. His only excuse being that he is no prophet, that he does not have the strength of John the Baptist. Prufrock looks back upon the event and thinks about his failure. He asks, would it have been worth it after all? But his fear of being misunderstood makes him accept his failure. So what kind of a man is Prufrock? J. Alfred Prufrock is an unhappy, frustrated man. He is involved in a routine of social life and he does not feel comfortable in the society in which he is condemned to live. He sees boredom and monotony. Though he, is, though he is conditioned by that fashionable society, he seems to be tired of the superficial world and miserable existence he is leading. He is isolated in an alien world. Prufrock personifies the paralysis, indecisiveness, uncertainty, boredom, fragmentation, disillusionment, passivity and isolation that Eliot and many other writers considered so typical of 20th century culture. So does he have your sympathy, or do you see him as a pathetic figure? He feels old before his time, and he is fixated on his own mortality. He obsesses about others' opinions. He feels trapped in an era in which social etiquette is meaningless. He assumes that other people are indifferent or hostile. He is sexually attracted to women, but is too timid to act on any sexual impulse. Unable to establish a vital connection with any other person, he wanders through life, fearing loneliness, but unable to challenge or defeat it. He seems to be a reticent, awkward, painfully self-conscious character, but he is also intelligent. He is crippled with self-doubt and frustrated by his poor self-image his inadequate physical appearance and inability to speak to women. He lacks the energy to pursue his goals and dreams. He seems cut off from belief in any higher purpose or being that might give his life meaning or direction. He is a symptom of the spiritual decay of his time. Throughout the poem, Prufrock compares himself to a number of figures and objects. Michelangelo, John the Baptist, Lazarus, and Hamlet, the protagonist of Shakespeare's tragedy, famous for his hesitancy and indecision. Hamlet's major flaw was procrastination, but even Hamlet acts to avenge his father's death at the end of the play. Instead, Prufrock believes he lacks the majesty and charisma of Hamlet and is more like Polonius, the foolish advisor to the king in the play, an unimpressive character, the object of ridicule and derision. A pathetic figure. So is Prufrock saying he will never be the main character in his own play? In the poem, we cannot see any form of logical structure, despite the fact that it is divided into several sections. There is only the structure of the flow of thoughts in Prufrock's mind. The poem is based on the free association of ideas and images without connective and transitional passages. It renders the flow of impressions, visual, auditory, physical, that impinge on the consciousness of Prufrock, a technique similar to the stream of consciousness used by writers such as James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. People in the poem appear as disembodied parts or ghostly actions. He never explicitly describes the woman who, who Prufrock imagines, except in fragments and plurals. For example, eyes braceleted arms, hair, skirts. Modernist poets and writers believe that their artistry should mirror the chaotic world that they lived in. Seldom is meaning in the real world parceled up and handed over in whole parts. It is interesting to know that Prufrock himself is fragmented. We did not have a complete image of him, but a half image of his morning coat and the collar button to his chin, a modest necktie, thin arms and legs, and his bald patch. The conclusion of the poem is poignant and tragic. There is a reference to mermaids, often known as sirens, who sing to sailors to lure them. However, in this instance, it seems that Prufrock is saying, I'm so pathetic, even the mermaids won't sing to me. They sing to each other and move away. These mermaids are the enchanting, 
enchanting antithesis of the distant, unsympathetic women with whom he normally interacts, but they are only an illusion. We usually experience a sense of relief when we wake from a dream, but he is the opposite. When he wakes, he feels he is drowning in the reality of his own life. He feels suffocated by a return to the lifeless, meaningless society, the metaphorical hell in which he feels condemned to spend his days.